So we'll go ahead and get started. We'll pick up where we left off yesterday. Uh, like yesterday, anytime you have a question, uh, just shout out. Or uh, if you really prefer, you can type it in the chat, although I may not see it right away. So these two blocks are not used as often as what we've covered so far, but I want to mention them in the context of motors. The first one is only available as spike prime because it refers to the relative position of the motor's axle and the EV3 motors don't keep track of the relative position while the spike prime motors do. Um, so this is the value of a particular motor's axle position. Uh, the example here is a motor connected to port A. And that can be plugged into any white oval in another block and used to affect what another block does, including uh, math calculations, also known as data, which we'll be covering um, in a day or two. Uh, so that's out of context for now. Similarly, uh, the block at the bottom is, returns the current speed of a particular motor. Uh, in this example, the speed of motor A, that is the motor connected to port A, and it returns it in a percentage. Maximum speed would be, of course, 100, and uh, not running at all would be zero. And that, again, can be plugged into any other block uh, to influence what it does, or it can be used in a calculation, uh, and that calculation then could be used, plugged into another block. Any questions about that? So there are a bunch of other uh, motor blocks. I'm not going to go through them in detail, um, but the one in the upper left uh, allows you to say that a particular motor is going to run for a certain number of rotations at a particular speed. So you could say, uh, you could change it to B, motor connected to B, it's going to go for two rotations at 25% its maximum speed. Second block um, is similar, but it starts the motor at a particular speed and it'll keep running until you say stop. And we saw the stop block um, on another slide. That would be a little bit more complicated, but is there for maximum flexibility. Um, the uh, next one has to do with uh, setting the degrees counted. Actually, I'm not sure how that works. I've never used it. And the next one um, returns the number of degrees counted so far. Um, the next one is similar to starting a motor at a, a speed, but instead it, it's at a relative power. Um, the input to the motor is a certain amount uh, uh, of power in terms of what's uh, it's actually given a pulse. So if if it's continuous voltage, it's 100%. If the pulses are on half the time and off half the time, that's 50%. But depending on how much friction they are, 50% power may not be 50% speed. So uh, you, you can actually distinguish between speed and power uh, for maximum flexibility. Although I might guess you would normally uh, choose speed because that'll give you a more precise result. Uh, you can ask for the current value of the power, you know, similar to the uh, block we saw on the previous slide uh, where you asked for the current uh, speed. Uh, you can set what happens when you stop a motor. Does it try to brake immediately or does it coast? Um, and there's also a way to uh, turn on stall detection so that you can determine uh, whether a uh, motor is and no longer running, not because it's not receiving any power, but something like a jam gear or it's run up against the wall uh, is keeping it from running. And that next block is how you detect that. Uh, is, is it currently uh, interrupted or not, uh, true or false? So uh, these will make a lot more sense in context, and we will use one or two of them in examples coming up. Any questions about those uh, nine different blocks? Um, 
To access these, similar to yesterday, you access them uh, by going to the lower left-hand corner in Spike Prime and uh, clicking on the icon and um, then clicking on more motors and you get an additional these additional nine blocks. In the EV3 version uh, of Scratch, uh, which is called EV3 Classroom, those blocks are always in the menus, but for uh, simplicity at first, they're, they're left out of the menus and when you go through these options, they show up in a separate menu called Mo Motors at, at the lower uh, bottom. And we'll see that in context in a minute. So I think we've got both Patty and Benjamin uh, signed in and may, maybe somebody besides uh, Patty and Benjamin. So welcome everybody. So you've got PDF versions of these slides, I hope, uh, because I emailed the, these slides yesterday and we'll be starting the next group that I emailed you today. So at your leisure, uh, please go through uh, these homework slides. Uh, ideally, actually do them using a kit, using the actual software, but at least think through uh, how you might put together a program by a series of blocks that would do these things. Uh, each step might be a single block or it might require two or three blocks. And here's another series. Uh, move forward for five wheel rotations um, and then turn 90 degrees using a movement block and then uh, move forward again. So it sounds like we're trying to go in a square. So uh, that's a long way of saying drive it in a square. And that actually comes up in one of the lessons that Lego Education provides for the Spike Prime. So the next topic is sensing the world or, or sensors. Um, so you want to switch to the PDF file that I sent you today. Uh, sensors are the way that uh, a robot can respond to the environment. They're the direct analog to human senses. The color sensor is roughly analogous to our uh, sense of sight. Uh, the force sensor um, is similar to our sense of touch, or we can uh, tell how hard we're pushing against something or something's pushing against us. Um, in the EV3 kit, the, uh, so that sensor is much simpler to either on or off, so it's called a touch sensor instead of a force sensor, but the Spike Prime kit actually has a fancier version of that that can actually measure uh, the amount of force as well as whether it's on or off. Uh, the distance sensor uh, uses ultrasound. It sends out an ultrasound pulse and measures how long it, it takes for the sound to come back and calculates the distance in inches um, or in centimeters. And in the EV3 kit, that's called the ultrasonic sensor, but it's used to measure distance. And Spike Prime, it's called the distance sensor. Both kits have a gyro. Uh, the big difference is uh, in EV3, the gyro is a, a separate. Uh, sensor that you plug into a particular port, it uses one of the uh, uh, eight ports or actually one of the four sensor ports on the EV3. On the Spike Prime, the gyro is inside the hub, so it doesn't require connecting it and it doesn't count against your maximum number of uh, connector ports. Um, you can also, on both kits, use the buttons on the hub or the, that big brick as if they were sensors. Um, to influence what the robot does, but if your uh, team is thinking about pressing one of those buttons, uh, they should probably restrict to pressing them while they're in home base because touching a robot outside of home base, you lose both, uh, they lose bonus points. Um, well, maybe it's worth it. Maybe there's some something they want to trigger once out of base that's uh, worth uh, losing some bonus points. So let's delve into one particular sensor. Um, the, let's see, I can probably show you that too on the webcam. Uh, it's right here on this robot. Um, it's actually turned on right now. It has an LED, it produces light, and then it uh, measures uh, either the intensity of the light coming back, or in the case of what we're looking at on the screen right now, it measures uh, the color that's coming back. 
So it puts out a white light and then uh, measures what color it gets back from the surface that it's pointing at. This predictor sensor is pointing down on a robot. So uh, that would be a, a reasonably good place to put the sensor if you wanted to detect the color of the map as the robot moved across the map. Uh, the EV3 has the equivalent sensor, uh, but uh, for reasons that maybe are historic or random, instead of giving you uh, a uh, selection by uh, actual colors, uh, they're the English words. And I assume that if you select a different language, uh, you get a, uh, a, a different list. Uh, but we're, we've selected English and uh, so it provides a list of colors in English. So uh, this particular brick is an event brick, and that's true of the one on the previous slide. Um, the, and what that is saying is, I've got some additional blocks plugged into this block. I haven't shown them yet. And I want those to do their thing when uh, the a red color or whatever color I select is detected by the sensor. And I don't want to do those blocks until you see red. Um, so the robot might be doing something else with a different stack of blocks, but it won't uh, perform or execute the blocks plugged into this event block until it sees red or whatever color selected. And likewise, on the EV3 equivalent of the same block, um, it won't uh, do the following blocks, the blocks plugged into it, unless a particular color is uh, detected. Any questions about that event block? Uh, so, another way of using the light sensor is uh, essentially a grayscale. Instead of asking for a color, you're asking for how much light is reflected back from the surface. In some cases, that may be more reliable. If you're trying to uh, go across a light colored map until you get to uh, a dark gray, rather than uh, trying to figure out whether that's black enough to be uh, detected as black, you can go by percentages. And if it's getting back uh, more than 40% reflected light, it's probably not black that it's looking at. And when it suddenly drops below 40%, it's either uh, black or dark gray or uh, navy blue. And maybe that's all equivalent as far as what the, uh, your team members want uh, to detect and they want the robot to stop or turn um, when that happens. Um, so the, the two blocks here that are not event blocks, one of them uh, is a true false block and it'll, uh, in the way it's been configured on the screen, it will be true if a, a light sensor uh, or color sensor to be more exact is plugged into port A and the value of the reflected light is less than 50%, it becomes true and it'll be false otherwise. You would then plug that into another block to influence what that other block does. Um, and that other block could be an event block or it could be an if block. And we'll see uh, examples of that, particularly uh, when you get into more complicated programs uh, in the next couple of days where we'll, we'll be doing control flow. Um, the block at the uh, lower half of the screen um, returns a value. Um, so it gives a number instead of a true false value. So if you want to know what percentage of uh, gray or, or light, actually, uh, on a high number is, is closer to white and a low number is closer to black, um, then you would use this oval shaped block and it would return a number. So if it was a bright area of the map, it might be 70% or 65 or 85. If it was a dark area of the map, it might be 20, 30, or maybe 35% light reflected. And though that number would probably be used in some kind of calculation to make a decision. Um, so what are we looking at now? We're looking at 
eggs, the, a very close equivalent to what we just discussed, except for we've switched to what the blocks look like in EV3. You can know that it's a longer block because it's got uh, more English words on it uh, than the previous one, is reflected light intensity less than. This one just says reflection less than. So it's a wordier block in the case of BB3 for some reason, um, but it does the same thing and it has the same choices. You can set it to less than, greater than, or equal, and you can change the number that it's looking for. And um, the other thing that is uh, relevant is that plugging in a sensor on the EV3 has to be plugged into a numbered port. So your these blocks for the EV3, I give you the choice of one, two, three, or four while uh, the Spike Prime version gives you letters because you can plug the sensors on a Spike Prime into any lettered port. So again, the, the, the significant difference in these blocks has to do with the difference in the kit itself because uh, the, uh, the big brick called the hub is different in those two different kits. Any questions about the color sensor and uh, the two versions of the blocks according to whether you've got Spike Prime or EV3? Okay, I'm going to exit out of um, this, come back to that slide. I'm going to go to Spike Prime. And I'm going to uh, say home. And I'm going to go look for lessons. Here's the lessons at the bottom under unit plans. There are four unit plans. The one I'm interested in is in the lower right, the yellow one, which is competition ready. This is actually a reference to first Lego league. So a bunch of the lessons included with the spike prime software and uh, similar lessons are available with the EV3 software, but they're not identical. Um, if I then go into the uh, lessons, uh, the unit of lessons, I get some choices and I can uh, scroll down and Choose a particular one by this scroll bar here. I've got training camp one, training camp two, training camp three, and on it goes. So these are things that the, uh, your team members, if they're using Spike Prime, might want to go through as learning experiences that are independent of this year's um, challenge. Uh, but the very last one on this list is a crane mission. Um, and I think that's from last year. So if I were to update this software, I believe this mission would change to a mission that's relevant to the, uh, last year. So I make a mental note uh, to update my software to see if it changes from a crane mission to a mission in uh, the, uh, I think it's called preview this year, isn't it? A sports theme. So I'm gonna go into this, to the training camp one lesson. And it gives us a, a little video we can watch. We can expand the video by clicking here, but I'm not going to do that in the interest of time. And then it tells us we want to build a robot that looks like that and gives us step-by-step -step instructions if we click on build. And I'll, I'll show you that way too fast. It says make sure your battery uh, is plugged into your big brick and find uh, these various parts and start plugging them in together. And the reason I'm going through so quickly is today we're talking about programming, not building, and uh, it, there's a good chance that your team members are already pretty good at bu following building instructions. Um, and if I click on done, it'll go back to the lesson, and you already saw this robot. I've added some sensors to the robot and something to the front, but you can see it's the uh, equivalent robot to what we were just told to build, so I'm ahead of the game. So I click on this right arrow and it goes into another part of the lesson that includes uh, sample blocks. And we actually used this top section yesterday and this third section yesterday because uh, they were good examples of uh, driving a robot without a sensor. Uh, and I skipped this one yesterday because we hadn't introduced sensors, but now we have, we're going to uh, drill down a little bit on the gyro sensor that's built in. 
I'm zooming in. If you may see me hitting the plus thing, the magnifying glass, so it's bigger on your screen. So let's, let's take a look at what this stack box does. It says, when the program starts, wait for one second. Why wait for one second? Well, it's got another stack of blocks that it needs to execute when the program starts. And so it's giving it a second for those three uh, lavender blocks to execute, setting the motors to C and D ports, 50% speed, uh, one rotation is equivalent to 17 and a half centimeters based on the wheel size for this robot. And the, six, the second uh, stack of blocks will start at the same time, but will have waited one second and then it will set the yaw angle to zero. And that's a reference to one of the three directions that the gyro in, in the brick can detect. In the, in the yaw direction, I'll explain a bit further, but it's the direction that your team will almost always wanna use when it's using the gyro. It's a reference to avionics uh, as in airplanes and spacecraft, and yaw is also used in uh, sailboats. Uh, a, a boat can pitch uh, this way, um, it can roll this way, likewise a plane, but when it turns left and right, that's referred technically to as yaw, and uh, that's the most common thing that we wanna be able to detect when the robot is moving around on a playing field. So I've uh, the, the lesson is selected yaw, and we can actually click here and see that it does indeed, uh, with Spike Prime, give you the choices of pitch, roll, and yaw. Uh, but yaw is, is what we want to detect here. So what is it trying to do? It's saying reset the yaw to angle to zero. No matter where I put the robot down on the field, consider what the direction it's pointing to now as zero. Uh, and then start moving uh, right. 100 is a reference to uh, this maximum turn radius uh, that you, or minimum radius of turn, maximum uh, turn as in turn in place. Uh, to turn in place right, it gives uh, power, uh, in this case, 50% power to the left motor and negative 50% to the right motor, forcing the robot to turn in place to the right. How far? It says, well, keep doing that, but the program, not the robot, but the program will wait until the yaw angle is greater than 90. <coughs> so rather than having to, by trial and error, figure out how many axle rotations or how many seconds or how many degrees of the axle we need to turn. We're actually using the gyro and the gyro uh, will allow, will uh, not drop out into the next block until it reaches 90 and then it'll go to the next block and the, the next block says stop moving. So that's gonna turn off both motors. So again, Wait one second for the other box to run. Uh, reset the yaw angle to zero, wherever we're pointing now. Start turning uh, in place to the right. And the program then waits for the gyro detector to detect a yaw angle of greater than 90 and then drops to the next block and stops both motors. So let's see that on the actual playing field. So to do that, I need to change cameras. Give me a second. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen to give you a better, a bigger view. Um, you may remember yesterday this, the, uh, Helicopter circle was a different color. This is a clever thing for actually, for about 11 bucks, you can get this two-sided uh, map for your drone, if you happen to have a drone, and I do, and I got, I think, the drone for Christmas and the, the map for my birthday, or vice versa. So I got it on blue today because that works out better with what I want to show you. Um, and I've put this program I believe in the zero position, but I'm gonna go ahead and re-download it. You won't be able to see me because I've, well, I'll go ahead and turn screen sharing on again so you can see me do that. Go back to the Spike Prime software um, and click on zero. 
and then hit the down arrow button. I have to, I have to turn on my robot. It powered down on its own when I wasn't using it. So it, it this particular robot boots very quickly. Um, and now I, I, I could select a different number, uh, program slot. Uh, well, this is training camp one. So let me select uh, program slot one. And uh, I'm going to put this on the clone field. And this program is not in one now, but if I click, oh, I, it's not connected. I need to turn, uh, connect Bluetooth. Give me a second. Connect via Bluetooth. It's looking for whatever robots it can find. This is the one I need. It's connecting Bluetooth. Found, found it in previously paired, so that went pretty quickly. Now I should be able to download into slot one by hitting the down arrow. This little circle you can barely see in lower right says it, it did the download. The robot made a little twirling noise that you couldn't hear. Uh, now if I stop my screen share, uh, the map will be bigger. Um, so let's bring this up a little bit and start the program. So we waited one second and made a very precise right turn. So what would happen if we changed the program? So I'm going to reshare this program so you can see it on your screen. And I'm going to say uh, turn 180. And I'm going to re download that so that it's in the robot, not just on the screen. And I'm going to drop the screen share. Now it's already turned 90. And when I run this program again, it's going to. Uh, reset the gyro so it's not going to turn into this position to turn 180 from where it started oh why did it go? it keeps going that seems like a bug what did i do wrong Interesting. So there's a bug. I didn't expect that. So that's probably because it's uh, when it gets past 180, it probably drops to negative 179. And so I need to give it a smaller number. How about 175? So it stops just short of 180. And re download that. You would think that after 180 would be 181, 182, et cetera. But I think in, in this programming, um, all the angles to the left might be negative numbers. So I'm going to um, change it to 175 and see if that, if I'm guessing correctly, that that's the problem. So I think I re-downloaded, but I'll double check. So I'll reselect the program. Oh, I. And that fixed it. So, uh, uh, a word to the wise, 180, uh, by the time it detects 180, it's suddenly seeing negative numbers and it keeps going and looking for 180 forever. Um, so let me do that again so you can see it on the screen, uh, share the screen. Um, I can set this number to anything I want. So let me set it to 120, which would be one third of a circle, um, and re download it. And then make the image of the circle bigger again. Restart the program. So that looked like about 120. Uh, so let's belabor the point and see what happens if we 
try turning left. So one way to turn left is to turn this all the way around like that. Left is minus 100. And I'm going to guess that the angles are negative on that side. So I'm, I'm going to change this to minus 120. And I want it to be less than minus 120 because as, as it's turning left, it'll be minus 5, minus 10, minus 20. Uh, and I, uh, I want it to be less than my, uh, minus 120 before it stops. But I, this particular green brick doesn't allow me to change from uh, greater than to less than. That's frustrating. So I'm going to pull this out of line. I'm going to go over to operators, and I'm going to get the less than brick. And I'm going to take my, uh, plug it into the less than brick. And I'm going to change that one to minus 120. And I'm going to toss away the other one and drop this one in. So start moving. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up two things. This goes there. There we go. Start moving left, negative 100. Wait until the yaw angle is less than minus 120. So counterclockwise uh, until negative 120. I hope I'm leading us in the right direction. If not, we'll debug it together. So that's downloaded. Put it back this direction. We start the Okay. So I'm going to close out of this. And I'm going to go back to home. And I'm going to scroll back down uh, to unit plans and then competition ready. And I'm going to scroll down to training camp two. And it gives us an introduction and tells us to build a slightly different robot. And then gives us this sample program. So let's play with that program for a minute. I'm going to make this bigger so you can see it just a little bit better on your screen. Uh, when the program starts, set movement motors to C and D, which is what where we had them from before. Set the speed uh, to, for both motors to 30%. Uh, tell it to assume that one rotation is equivalent to 17 and a half centimeters because we think that's the circumference of our wheels. Uh, before it actually moves the robot, it says, uh, I want to move whatever's connected to E. So let's grab that robot and take a look. I'm going to drop a screen share and show you on the webcam. So I've got this motor connected to E. It goes back this way and around to here. Uh, it's connected to E. And this motor uh, has a gear on it that connects to this other gear. So when this motor rotates its axle, this should go up and down. So that's what's connected to E. Uh, but the uh, the uh, instructions say to go for one second, and that'll be way too long for the way I've got that uh, thing, and it uh, will start grinding the gears. So I'm going to anticipate that problem rather than doing harm to my little plastic robot. I'm going to change this to a third of a second clockwise and a third of a second counterclockwise, which I think from prior experimenting is going to be a little bit more what is reasonable here. Um, and then I'm going to download this. Uh, since this is training camp two, I'll put it in slot number two. And I'll, well, I didn't show that to you on the screen. My apologies. Let me show you the screen briefly. 
the change I made was right here. I changed it from one second in both of these to a third of a second so that uh, it's going to turn the uh, motor clockwise for a third of a second or 0.3 seconds and counterclockwise for 0.3. And I downloaded that into the robot. So I'm going to actually hold it up here. I'm going to put it on two and we're going to watch this arm move. So a third of a second was enough to move it up and then down. And let's see if I started up here to get this side of the zone. So if we wanted a bigger movement, we could go back to the program. This time I'll remember to show it on the screen and change it to, let's say, in one direction, 0.7, and the other direction, 0.4. And this is in seconds. We could change it to rotations, but we'll stick to seconds for the moment. Put that in the robot. Make it bigger. So it went way up and then down a little bit. So I'm going to force it down. Seven, seven, seven tenths of a second is enough to you know, go way up and then three tenths, it just brings it down a little bit. So that may or may not be what your team needed. And I would recommend not doing it with seconds. I'd recommend doing it with rotation. So let me go back to the program. And I could change it to rotations um, or degrees. And in interest of time, I'll just ask you to trust me uh, that it would probably work. I'd uh, say 45 degrees up and then come back down 30 degrees. So that would be a more precise way of controlling that, that arm going up and down, uh, depending on whether we're trying to lift something, grab something, pull something, drag something. Um, we, we would program that arm to do something, or we change the mechanics to something more appropriate to whatever mission uh, the team is doing. And by we, I mean the team members, of course. So the other reason I chose this lesson, other than it being lesson two, is it uh, has built into it a program that is, uh, starts going as soon as you push the right button on the robot, um, it goes straight uh, and it keeps going straight until the uh, distance sensor plugged into F is closer than 10 centimeters. Uh, I'm gonna change that to 20 centimeters because it, my uh, distance sensor is right there and this arm sticks out about 10 centimeters. So I want it to stop when it gets here. Maybe that's what would be appropriate. Or maybe 10 would be better. But for now, I'm gonna say I want to stop short of ramming into the wall or whatever it's gonna detect. Uh, and if we follow this cable around, it goes around to F, which is what the program says, F, so uh, this same robot now has a program that's going to detect a wall. So I need a wall. My handy dandy two by six. Um, so let's make sure I downloaded that. When I started it, it's going to wiggle that arm again because that's still in the program. And then when I hit the right button, it's going to do the other program. Okay, so wiggle the arm based on what we did before. And this time it was in degrees because that's what we changed it to. And then I'm going to hit right. It's going to go looking for wall. And if, if you, that looks like more than 20 centimeters, but. Uh, that's what it decided. Let's do that a second time for completeness.
So I'd have to get my uh, metric scale to uh, determine whether that's really 20 centimeters away, but um, perhaps it's it's not as precise as I would like it, or maybe my eye is um, mistaking that it looks more like uh, 25, 30 centimeters to my eye, but maybe the robot's right. Any questions about that? The, uh, the use of uh, programming the motor uh, by seconds, by degrees, by rotations, uh, using the uh, ultrasonic distance sensor to uh, cause a robot to stop after it's gone straight for a while. Let's see, I've got my chat window closed. Let me see if there's anything in chat. No, nope, nothing in chat. All right, let's push on. Uh, I'm going to switch cameras back in case you want to see me. Uh, Now I take that back. Let's go to the color sensor now. So I'll leave that the way it is. I'm going to go back to the software. I'm going to close this lesson. I'm going to check to see what time it is. Still got some time. I'm going to go back to home. I'm going to go back to the same way I went before, but this time. I'm going to go to training camp three. And if you find this confusing, it's because I'm going over it a little fast and completely, but these lessons are all available in the Spike Prime software and there's similar uh, lessons in the AB3 software. So now we're in training camp three and I'm gonna skip the intro. I'm gonna skip the build instructions because I've already done the build. Um, and we're going to look at a different program that's a sample program. So this program says what uh, when the left button is pressed, it does something when the right button is pressed. That means when I press that center button, the program will start, but no, no blocks will execute. It'll be waiting for either the left or the right because I didn't give it anything to do immediately. Um, so with the left button, uh, it will set the, uh, the motors it's using for uh, driving around to C and D, set the speed to 50%, set the, uh, tell it to start moving uh, but go and go straight, uh, no left turn, no right turn, go straight and look for black. Well, my map doesn't have any black on it. So it's got a white circle on it uh, and a white H. So I'm gonna say, look for white. Um, and then down here, it's got another program. It says when the right button is pushed, again, set the uh, drive motors to C and D, set a variable called power to 50, and uh, then use that to uh, power the left motor at zero power and the right motor at, at whatever power set to, we said that was set to 50, we could, pl we could plug in um, 50 directly in, in here as well, but this is setting a variable called power, a little more descriptive. So if you give the left motor zero power and the right motor 50% power, that will cause it to, to start pushing left. Uh, then it's going to wait looking for black, but again, there's no black, so I'm going to change the black to white. Um, and once it finds white, it's going to switch to driving to the right by giving power to the left motor. And it's going to be looking for white again, but it, I need to give it something different to look for. I'm gonna have it look for blue, which is the rest of, the, of my uh, helicopter map. So what this is doing is trying to follow uh, a, uh, a change in color. And since my map has white and blue on it, it will follow the edge between white and blue whenever it, uh, it is not seeing uh, white, it will turn left whenever it's, and then it will stop looking for white uh, once it finds white. Um, it'll drop down and it'll change to turning right because it's giving power to the left wheel and they'll start looking for blue and it will keep going right with power to the left. I'm sorry, this is kind of a double negative. Looking for blue and when it hits blue, it will uh, 
continue, but what does this do? We've got a loop that says do this forever. So it's just going to do this until we hit that stop button. Uh, so we'll see what the, all of this actually does in the robot. A lot make a lot more sense. This is training camp uh, three. So I'm going to change this to program slot three just for ease of memory. Download it to my robot. It's like my robot kind of fell asleep. That's interesting. You're going to have to reconnect it. I lost its Bluetooth connection. Okay, it's reconnected. Bluetooth is re reconnected. Now I should be able to do that download. Okay, it made a clicking sound that you might have been able to hear. Let me do that again, right up against my microphone. You might be able to hear that. It didn't make the click that sound. At least when I've got earphones on, maybe I couldn't hear it. Okay, program three. If I drop the screen share, we'll have see a big blue circle. Uh, when I select the program, it starts running, but it doesn't do anything because we didn't give it anything to do for just start. But if I hit the left button, it should be looking for white. And as soon as it finds white on the playing field, it should stop. It found the white in the uh, H there and stop. So let me uh, cheat a little bit. I'm going to align it to the edge, and I'm going to use the right button and see if it wiggles back and forth, looking for blue, looking for white, looking for blue. Oh, it went over and found that edge instead. But that's still fairly nice looking. It's now going around the circle, following the edge between blue and white. So that's not the most efficient line follower, but you can imagine that could be useful for your team to be able to follow a, a color scheme on the mat to get to a particular place on the mat more reliably than go, using rotations or seconds. Uh, they might be able to get it to run a, uh, what they without a sensor um, some of the time, but if they want a reliable solution using the distance sensor or the color sensor, it's much more likely to get uh, repeatable results. Any questions about that? Well, it's as I predicted, it's doing it forever. So I'm going to have to reach down and push the stop button. All right. So now I will go back to the slides. We've covered quite a bit of ground. But let's see uh, what's left on the slides. Hopefully, this is more interesting, even if it's a bit more confusing to see it with the actual programming and the actual robot than uh, to give you uh, what some people refer to as death by PowerPoint. But we'll give you a taste of that. So we left off uh, on uh, talking about reflected light, which we, we haven't done an example of grayscale, but that's a variation on what we did with color. Um, the next slide is going to talk about the pressure sensor, uh, which is another sensor in the kit, which we haven't demonstrated. Uh, if we have time at the end, I can uh, try to hook up a pressure sensor and demonstrate that for you. But you have four choices in Spike Prime. Uh, is it pressed? Uh, so start doing some blocks when uh, the pressure sensor is pressed. Um, hard pressed is... Uh, pushing it all the way down rather than just tapping it, or wait until it's released, or uh, wait until the pressure on that sensor changes. Now, that's all kind of interesting. I could demonstrate this for you uh, with a little bit of time by using my finger, but that's not 
what you're going to, uh, the team is likely to uh, do. If they want to use this at all, they're going to probably put some kind of mechanism like uh, a swivel arm on the robot that when it swivels, it applies a certain, uh, applies pressure to this sensor so that maybe it moves until it, uh, the sensor to, to the swivel arm touches the wall in the four by eight playing field. Uh, and then it detects that swivel arm pressing up against the wall by a change in pressure on the sensor. And it says, oh, I found the wall. Now I want to back off and turn left, or now I want to back off and run until I find blue. Uh, so it gives them another degree of freedom of making decisions on the playing field using the pressure sensor. Uh, if you will, it's the touch of uh, the sense of touch um, to complement uh, the uh, limited color vision that the uh, robot has and the, and the limited ultrasonic sensing it has. On the EV3, it's really the equivalent, uh, but uh, it's in terms of the brick, but there's fewer choices. The sensor that comes with the EV3 kit, because EV3 kit's been around for a while, is less sophisticated. It's called a touch sensor, and it's either pressed or not pressed. It's, there's no uh, hard press or, or soft press. Um, and in fact, the pressure sensor um, on the Spike Prime even has a way of getting a number of newtons of force, but uh, that would be more unusual, uh, but we may come to that brick later. Uh, here's the ultrasonic sensor that we uh, actually demonstrated. Uh, you can see the little icon that looks a little bit like the sensor on the robot. Uh, uh, here, this in this example, we're assuming it's connected to A. I think in our demo, it was connected to F. Uh, when it's closer than uh, 8%, uh, and we have some choices here, uh, we can select percent, we can select centimeters, we can select inches. Um, and on the EV3, it's very similar, except uh, it, it spells out the words. And uh, for some reason, the EV3 uh, tends to be a little bit more uh, word intensive. So here's some things we saw on the screen, uh, pretty similar to what we saw. When the program starts, it does something. When the program uh, detects a color, it does something different. We can also have it do things based on uh, the left and right buttons, and you saw us do that. The EV3 brick has lots of buttons on it. Uh, so there's actually six different choices of what you can program the EV3 to detect and uh, start a sequence of blocks based on pressing various buttons on the EV3. The Spike Prime has six choices for sensors, not including the gyro because that's built in, and the buttons uh, don't count for uh, port numbers and uh, the timer likewise. The EV3 has four choices where you, you plug in uh, the sensors. You can get true false values from the sensors, you can get a values from some of the sensors. Uh, the um, true false values are, are shown here for the EV3. And here's the values you can get back. Uh, the, uh, you can get back a, a value for the color, for the percentage uh, light, the number of newtons from the force sensor, the number of centimeters or percent or inches from the distance sensor. You can uh, ask the timer for how much time is left. And you, uh, similar things for the EV3, but uh, the difference is the uh, um, the touch sensor is always true false. So there's no value you get back from that. Uh, we use the gyroscope uh, in a different way. The gyro on this on the uh, EV3 is uh, always an angle, always a yaw. There's no pitch and roll. And here's the homework. 